to see the sea monster. Sea monster well, it's not even, episode. It's not a sea monster. Well, a lake yeah. monster. Yeah, like quasi. Meh. Quasi. Meh. 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 Close enough. <laughs> Hello, dear well, listeners thing. of the Mad Scientist Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cogswell, here with my co-host, Marie Mayhew. Marie, how you doing? I am just fine. How are you doing? What's going on out there? I feel like it's been a million years. Yeah, it's been um, it's been like a week since we last recorded, or two weeks because we recorded what? two in a row. Because we're machines. Yeah, absolutely. So it's pretty we're exciting. Podcast making machines over here. Podcast making machines. Uh, so yeah, things things are going good. I'm excited for this week's episode. We're talking mm-hmm. about the mm-hmm. Lake Tahoe's monster. Mm-hmm. Okay, known mm-hmm. as Tahoe Tessie. Tahoe Tessie. Which is an adorable name. Shout outs to Tess yeah. Feifel. Yes. Of Astonishing yes. Legends. Yes. Uh, good job on, on having a name of a sea monster or lake monster. And we're Not gonna everybody in- does. We're going to get into it, Marie. <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Scientist Podcast. Today's episode, Tom O'Tessie. All right. Um, oh okay. Poor Tess. Poor, Poor Tess, Tess is probably like, Tess is like, please stop making references to me in your podcast. I know. This is like the third or fourth one. It's pretty rough. <laughs> so. We get to uh, cease and desist le- letter. Oh, my goodness. Pretty soon. That'll be so, good. So, uh, Marie. Tahoe, yes. Ta- Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, right in my neck of the woods. It sure is. It sure is in yes. your neck of the woods. So. So for those that don't know, so Lake Tahoe is uh, one of the largest lakes in America. Yeah. It is uh, in the Sierra Nevada of the United States. Mm-hmm. It basically is on the, uh, it's on the line between California and Nevada and is mm-hmm. west of Carson City. Yes. Now it is, it is the largest alpine lake in North America and it has, uh, it has uh, a total Depth of 1,645 feet. So it's also the second deepest lake in the U.S. after Crater Lake, which is in Oregon, which is 1,945 mm-hmm. feet. Give or take. Give or take. All right. Give or take. Now, yes. we're obviously not talking about this lake because of its depth, although that's impressive. That is impressive. It's I beautiful, guess. too. We're talking it's a beautiful about lake, area. We're talking about Lake Tahoe because of the... Because of the legend surrounding the lake. Now, like any other big body of water, there is just a... Or not so big body of water. Basically any body of water, there's always <laughs> legends and lore and myths that pop up around... You know, you know, just water bodies yeah. generally, I think, are pretty... Are considered... Uh, spooky. Yeah, like spooky and kind of mysterious and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, right? And so uh, Lake Tahoe being so big and also... You know, really having uh, America is, I think, a a really fertile place for kind of cryptid stories and also just kind of legends in general, because we really were pretty. I mean, we were still essentially, you know, wilderness, right, with the major Mm -hmm. civilizations being kind of uh, relatively disperse uh, tribes of, of Native Americans Right there, it wasn't it, it wasn't developed over the same course of history as say Europe, where you know the house you're living in could be from the Renaissance, right? In America, this you know the, the, these parts yeah. of the country have maybe been around for a hundred years. Yeah, and this that. especially is, would be hard to get to. Right, right, you know, and, this I, and was I mean, kind of an arduous task for somebody, and you know, if it's in a any type any type of equipment besides. A uh, four-wheel drive, pretty yeah, much. Well, right, absolutely. So, you know, uh, Lake Tahoe then really is very, very... It's really uh, quite fertile with legends and, and mythologies and things. Now, originally, the area surrounding kind of Lake Tahoe, the Lake Tahoe region, was uh, inhabited by the Washoe or Washoa tribe of Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Uh, the word that they had for Lake Tahoe is their word da, which it means literally means the lake. So I guess Tahoe becomes da. I guess that's what da or da or da-ho I don't know how to say means, it. Yeah. Not great at this, 
But anyways, so uh, the first person to really see this lake was in 1844. It was an exploratory expedition by John C. Fremont. Um, and uh, basically uh, found it and was like, oh, my God, it's so cool. And so he uh, named it Lake. That's what he said, too. <laughs> he said, this is super cool. This oh, my is God, awesome. you guys. Come look at this lake. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> It's been a long, it's been a long day and I'm just, you know what? I'm just sort of relieved. We're just talking about, we're talking about a, a lake monster. Oh, it's going to be great. Now, originally Marie, Lake Tahoe, mm. can you guess what it was called before it was Lake Tahoe? Oh my God. No. Great Basin. No. 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 You're what? never going to guess it. It's insane. I'm never going to guess it. Lake okay. Bigler. Lake Bigler? In, in honor of California's third governor, John Bigler. Fighting John. No, I don't. Bigler of true. Now, uh, the lake really, it started to become, uh, kind of started to become more, more available to people really, um, because of, uh, because of, you know, mining, because of, uh, coming to get, uh, trees and, and wood and things. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, became ultimately, uh, became ultimately a resort community, uh, Tahoe yes. city in 1864. Yeah. Because of All the right. fresh air and the, the water, right? And its yeah. rejuvenating effects. Yeah. Now, the lake then was, it's, it's, so it's been from that point forward kind of a very popular tourist attraction, right? Yeah. Um, there have been attempts to try to make it a national park, but it's never succeeded. And, and really, it's just become a, uh, just become kind of a beautiful part of the country to go visit and, you know, uh, do kind of lake summer fun stuff on. And winter. And, oh, and winter. Sorry, Marie. Oh, yeah. And well, winter. And winter, well, I mean, skiing is huge in Lake Tahoe. Tahoe Air is big, big, big for skiing. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's interesting that it started, you know, as sort of a, I don't want to say a resort, but a resort and touristy community. And that's kind of how it has stayed for quite some time. And it's like, it's expensive. Lake property and going up there is is not a cheap venture. Oh, it's crazy. There's a whole section on the Wikipedia page about beach rights. Yes, which, <laughs> which, is, which is immense because it is one of the few lakes, or it is a lake where you can actually, um, I believe, park or have a boat in proximity to the water, right? So you can have it right there. And it's, but with that, it's like, well, you know, you have pollution, you have a huge amount of um, environmental effort to keep the lake blue, keep Keep Tahoe blue is a big is a big uh, big slogan around there, and it and it makes sense too because it's like it is a huge tourist destination. So why wouldn't you want to at least have some? Um, sorry, Julia just rammed on the door. Um, Jake, just edit that out, please. <laughs> My daughter was like, ah! jumped. Um, it is a huge uh, it is a huge tourist area, but so you will have like a lot of pollutants or the ability to pollute the water which is kind of sad as well yeah so actually uh what's really interesting is the lake tahoe is um lake tahoe is is famously clear it is an extremely mm -hmm. clear water uh or extremely clear water and so because mm -hmm. of that it has some really interesting parts to it so this i'm actually going to read this this is a blog um from mm. uh, the special collections and university archives of the uh, university of nevada reno and this is by Kimberly Roberts. She posted this on 16th of May, 2014. So I'm just going to, I'm going to read part of this whole thing. I think it's really pretty and I think it'll give you kind of the backstory better than we ever could. So quote cave rock, the majestic guardian of Lake Tahoe presides with regal silence over a shadowy and mysterious realm, harboring a hidden world full of secret beings who live in and around the lake. Hordes of people flock to Tahoe shores, single mindedly absorbed in their pursuit of the perfect vacation. So busy enjoying the many outdoor activities available in the Tahoe Basin that they remain oblivious to the invisible world that lurks just beneath the surface of the lake. There, out of sight, whole forests of trees and stumps stand silent, submerged within the sediments of earth and time at the bottom of the lake, ghostly witnesses to a medieval drought between the 9th and 12th centuries. In Fallen Leaf Lake, these haunting sentinels of the deep are up to 100 feet tall and mingle with even older trees that drowned between 18 and 35 centuries ago. 
remnants of a series of climatic changes reaching ever further back in time. Strewn among the lifelike roots of this underwater forest, fossilized remains of invertebrates and fish dating back as far as 11,000 years ago, now coated with a layer of sawdust from the Comstock timber industry, nestle comfortably among the many sunk and scuttled boats, laid to rest beneath the waters, each adding its own layer of mute but tangible history. Spooky. End quote. Um, and so then, uh, here, another section here that I really like, quote, John Calhoun Cockeye Johnson was the first Anglo to lay eyes upon Cave Rock and was so enthralled by its presence he rode over from Meeks Bay and discovered a mysterious grotto 200 feet high with icicles and stalactites. Curious to learn about its mysterious powers, he began to question the local Washoe elders. He heard of ancient legends about a water prison of demons that explained the moaning Mm. when the water level of the lake rises. It is beneath the watchful eye of Cave Rock known to the Washoe as Rock Standing Gray, that water babies romp in the waves. These are gray beings about one and a half feet tall, with long black hair that floats behind them when they walk. While they look like humans, they are damp and cold and have no bones. Thousands Ah. of them inhabit the waters of the Sierra Nevada, including streams, lakes, marshes, and ponds. Their cries can be heard at Mm. night, but are best ignored, as contact with Mm -hmm. them can lead to trouble. Only shamans dare yeah, enter Cave you Rock think? to consult with them, bringing <laughs> gifts and peace offerings, offerings. Perched above this hidden realm, Ong, a giant bird, preys on the humans who stumble unwittingly into his path, while a man-eating giant who lives in a nearby cave gets the people who neglect their duties. Frolicking along the beaches and rocks are the Weasel Brothers, Poetzeli and Damalali, who along with the water babies named all the places that dot the shore of Tahoe Names that still cling to the shores of this secret world. Most people have forgotten this world. Folklorists and historians know of it because it lives on in archives and books. Next time you venture up to the lake, stop and look around. Listen, if you pay attention, it is all right there in front of you. End quote. Yeah, just, you know, put down down the uh, the Bloody Mary and maybe listen for a little (laughs) bit. But but do not, don't go go after and try and be talking to the water babies. No. why is that like? What, doesn't it? Isn't that a foregone conclusion? Like, is there people? Are there people out there, dear listeners, that would be like, "Hey, I think that's a water baby. I should go check that out." There's thousands of them somewhere, damp little spongy bodies with no bones, just waiting to claim my soul and drag it under. Sounds fun. Well, so here's here's the really interesting thing, right? So, um, so actually, so mm-hmm. Lake Tahoe has a tremendous amount of legends surrounding it, yeah. right? Yeah. And so all of these come from, or most of these that I was able to find are from the Washoe people or uh, the Washua people. And so um, they actually have a really interesting, it's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good website here. So it's, um, well, Google uh, Washoe tribe history version two, it's a PDF. It comes up when you Google it. It's, it's very interesting. But so um, in here, they have information here about these legendary creatures. So they say, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to read a quote here from this. So quote, Washoe legends tell of several creatures that have special powers and lived in the Washoe territory. Water babies inhabited all bodies of water and are very powerful, sometimes causing illness or death to a person, but could also be a good omen. So, you know, either mm. way. Mm. Washoe healers it's just really, visited... It's just a coin flip on that one. Huh? Washoe healers visited the sacred cave rock where water babies lived to consult with them bring offerings of respect and to renew powers. There was also a man eating giant that lived in another cave near cave rock that preyed on people that were neglecting their duty. So I'm pretty sure this is like exactly where that other person got their info from. Anyways, yeah. there yeah. was a giant meeting and meeting. There was a giant man eating bird named Ong that nested in the middle of Lake Tahoe. Ong was so large and so powerful that his wings beats could bend the trees when he flew near shore. The legend tells that one day a Washoe man was snatched up by Ong and taken to his nest. Luckily, the Washoe is not eaten right away because Ong had another person to eat, so not so luckily for that guy. Yeah. Maybe he wasn't a Washoe, though. The Washoe you watched don't the have sh- to be, yeah. You don't have to be the fastest. You have, just have to be faster than that guy, but Ong gets first. The Washoe watched the giant bird eat and noticed that it closed its eyes to chew. The Washoe got an idea. Every time the bird closed its eyes, he threw several arrowheads into its open mouth. By nightfall, Ong was very sick. A storm raged through the night, but by morning, the monster was dead. 
The Washoe plucked out one of its massive feathers and used it as a boat to reach the shore. The Washoe say that Ong's nest remains in Lake Tahoe, submerged out of sight. End quote. Now, <sighs> what's interesting here, though, is that there is no mention, as far as I can tell in many of these things, about Tahoe Tessie. Well, this is true. There's There are the water babies. There is the, the giant that, you know, will, will, you know, come and eat you or kill you if you don't mind your whatever, mind your duties, whatever <laughs> that is. And then you got the, you got Ong, right? Who, who, uh, who was just trying to enjoy a meal and, you know, that, that, that and into that bird. But like, yeah, nothing, nothing about, nothing about anything that lives under the water, but that's like a single entity. So what that must have been, my guess is like, again, more of a modern creation or, you know, provided if provided that she is real, quote unquote, that they just started seeing her like in the 1900s or something. Yeah. So um, what it what it appears to be exactly like you said, Marie, is that once European settlers came around mm -hmm. this story of a, you know, um, this story of a amazing, you know, creature in the lake started to spread and, you know, who knows how it really came about ultimately to, to get kind of the legend that it has, right? Yeah. But um, essentially, it has morphed into, because uh, you, don't, you don't really hear about the water babies anymore or, the, or Ong, the giant bird, even though the water babies, a little bit scarier in my opinion. Um, yeah. You know, they yeah. kind of, it kind of sounds yeah. like. Uh, it sounds like they should be cute. They're water babies. Nope. They're like, you know. Ugh. So, um. Here's uh, here's some stuff here on so Tahoe Tessie essentially is like other lake monsters, believed to be some kind of, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of mix of different kinds of uh, of animals, right? So you have mm -hmm. kind of the general uh, plesiosaur, right? You have other ideas that it's and so a plesiosaur is like the classic view of lake of, of lake monsters of the Loch Ness monster, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's also the idea of it being almost more like a giant serpent, similar to um, ser similar to Ogopogo, um, mm -hmm. right? But uh, but ultimately, the idea here is that Tessie is between ten to eighty feet long. Her body is often described, like on many websites, as being wide as wide across as a barrel, which to me doesn't really mean anything because I feel like barrels can be different sizes, but. That's fine. It's, it's a good ubiquitous, you know, measurement for a monster, right? It was yeah. barrel chested. It was as big as a barrel. You know, eh, you know. It's yeah. it's it's a little weird. So the uh, the first reportings of Tahoe Tessie were in the fifties, actually, mm -hmm. um, where it was two police officers off duty said that they saw a uh, like basically just a big black hump come out of the water, and uh, they were on their mm -hmm. boat. And so they chased after the thing, and it, it the, supposedly the thing kept pace with the boat, um, which was going at that point about 60 miles per hour or 97 kilometers per hour for our European listeners. Mm, nice. Good. Uh, after that, there was actually a, uh, a story about Tahoe Tessie in the San Francisco Chronicle, um, which ah, really is yes. how, really how the story became popular. And so... Uh, from that one, then, kind of the legend spread, right? So, well, um, one go ahead. famous story is that, and I will read it, it's from SF Gate, it's a reposting, but even famed oceanographer Jacques Cousteau is said to have had a brush with something horrific in a deep water dive in the mid 1970s. The world isn't ready for what is down there, is the quote most commonly credited. Cousseau never, never released any, f any photographs or data from the dive, adding to the mystery and legend. Some believe Cousseau was talking about a Loch Ness monster-like creature, but locals like to call Tahoe Tessie. Isn't that crazy? It I is think crazy. That's pretty crazy. Now, yeah. Marie, we're actually. I wish gonna... I would have done. I wish I would have done the quote in my in a French accent. The world is not ready for what I found down there. <laughs> It's okay. We're actually gonna, sorry. We're actually gonna, sorry, French listeners. Huh? We are actually going to talk about the Jack Cousteau story here at the end of the episode. Uh, dude, did you give me any warning? I didn't, but it's fine. Uh, 
Now, well, it could have just been, you know, okay, I'm, I'm now I'm going to go into spoiler territory. Go ahead, you go, you go. <laughs> okay, now, dude, you got to give me a heads up or a warning. I'm sorry, or else I'm, or else I'm going to get out the French accent on top. I'm of telling you, you got else. it, you got it to me here. Um, now here's the thing, right? These stories of Lake mm-hmm. of Tahoe Tessie are kind of interesting, uh, mostly because they are. I mean, they're they're common to other lake monster kind of stories. Mm-hmm. Right. And so um, part of that comes from, you know, this idea of, well, there's got to be something down there. The lake is so deep. It's so weird. Like what is down there? Mm-hmm. Right. Another part of it comes from the idea that there there actually are or we believe at least that there are big things in that lake. So one theory about what Tahoe Tessie might be is that it's a giant sturgeon. Right, so for anyone that doesn't know, sturgeon are, are fish that can grow to be pretty big. Sturgeon can get quite quite large, right? So um, the biggest sturgeon ever caught actually was 468 pounds. Dear God. Okay, that's the record for a sturgeon. But the largest one ever caught by a fisherman is was 12 feet long, 1,100 pounds. That's a monster. I would okay. consider that a lake monster. They are they are tremendous. Sturgeon can get to be very, very big. And so um, the idea here is that a sturgeon probably got released into the lake at some point or mm-hmm. found its way in or whatever. And so that is now being mistaken for uh, Tahoe Tessie. I can see that. What's, I think, actually more interesting about this story, though, mm-hmm. Marie, hmm. is not Tahoe Tessie. Mm-mm. Because really... it. By all accounts, Tahoe Tessie appears to be a tourist trap kind of thing. Oh. Okay. Aww. What's most so what interesting? What did Jacques see? Well, what so, did so see? Marie, what's most interesting surgeons? about the, what's huh. most interesting to the lake about me huh. is how the story of Jacques Cousteau got spread in the first place. How did it? Okay, Jacques Cousteau has never been to Lake Tahoe. Oh, say it's not so. He'd never been there. Okay, his son or his grandson Philippe Cousteau visited in 2002. Okay, Man, it's but, like you can't but, believe anything you read but anymore. But he he never went to Lake Tahoe either. <sighs> or rather, he never he never dived. Right, he just visited the area. He just had a he just had a Bloody Mary. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's like, you know, he visited, he didn't dive, he yeah. just was kind of like on Lake Tahoe, right? This is very nice. Okay. This is a lovely lake. Now, the thing is, too, the Jacques Cousteau story gets, mm-hmm. gets pushed in with the uh, Tahoe Tessie story. Mm-hmm. But originally, the rumor wasn't even about Tahoe Tessie. It wasn't about a monster at all. What Mm-mm. it was about, Marie, hmm. is the supposed presence of a mass graveyard on the bottom yes. of Lake Tahoe. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Now, which is actually probably more prevalent. <laughs> probably more likely than a right, monster. More likely. All right. Unfortunately, so, yeah. There's two ways that it's believed that this giant mass graveyard could have come about. All right. The first one is Lake Water Tahoe. Water babies. No. Lake Tahoe, as a mm-hmm. famous tourist attraction, of course, became very popular with with Hollywood of its time period back when, you know, Hollywood was sort of a little bit dangerous, right? The forties, the forties and fifties. Exactly. And also remember part of it is in Nevada. So gambling is legal on yeah. half of, on a third of the, uh, of the waterfront. So specifically where they would go is the Cal Nevada lodge also called the lady of the lake. Now, this this hotel or lodge, whatever you want to call it, was built in 1926 by a San Francisco businessman um, who was hoping to originally use it just for like him and his friends. It was then sold over to new owners, and then they got a gambling permit, like you mentioned, Marie. And uh, they then started it up as kind of a place for people to, you know, have big parties and whatever. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, after that point, so the 1930s, this place gets sold and turned into a kind of a gambling casino sort of thing. Okay? Mm-hmm. In 1935, a 11-year-old girl named Frances Gum, 
performed at the Cal Nevada. All right. Mm-hmm. And, it, and there was discovered and signed to MGM talent. Oh. Do you know what her name was changed to? No. Judy fucking Garland. Oh my God. We're going to have to bleep that. Okay. Now, now Marie. Okay. 1935. Judy Garland sings there before she's Judy Garland gets picked right. up by MGM. 1937. Right. The place burns to the ground. Really? Okay. My goodness. This is nefarious. We should and have the, just done it on this. Forget and the, Tahoe Tessie. And the, the legend says that the lodge was rebuilt uh-huh. in a month by like 500 to 600 workers. Hmm. They just That's went fast. crazy. That's and fast built the work. Thing up. Okay. Uh huh. Um. So the, it became known then as the Cal Neva Lodge. Is this the same? I'm going to ask a pop culture question. Is this the same, or is this like the basis for the movie uh, Bad Time at the El Royale? I don't know. Actually, maybe. Because that's basically the plot of somewhat of the plot of uh, the, uh, that movie. Hmm. Maybe. I know. Get your googling fingers on, people. So uh, the Sorry. place, the no, it's, it's fine. The place then became really popular with uh, people, right? Gamblers, uh-huh. uh, the mafia, right? All these other people, whatever. So. Nice. Specifically, nice. Uh, probably the biggest clientele they had at that time was the Kennedy family. Especially Joseph Kennedy was was very uh, was a frequent person there, a face that you'd see at the Cal Neva. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, eventually was then. Uh, through its kind of, you know, as a casino, as a place for people to come and see uh, big acts and things, became a really popular spot for Frank Sinatra, for Dean Martin, right? For that whole kind of crew of people. Yes. Right? Including their mafia ties. Just Googled it. It is, it, uh, the El Royale, the, the one in the movie is not based on any one in particular. Uh-huh. But Drew Goddard, the director, did say that it was largely based on Cal Nevada. Oh, interesting. Yes. Nice. Look at that. Look so, at us being all current. Um, so the Cal Neva then uh, became this big place now, and now it's like a real uproarious kind of party place, right? Frank Snatcher owns the place. There's all these people. The Rat Pack are there all the time, right? Marilyn Monroe showing up like every other weekend. This place is going crazy. They built secret tunnels specifically so that all the celebrities could get around without having to worry about the media and people. Okay. Nice. They, yeah. they, it, so it went from like the bungalows to these these lakeside kind of cottages that they built specifically for celebrities, um, right to Frank Sinatra's office supposedly, and then over to the helicopter port. My God. Uh, so some of the famous names that were there, right? So again, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., the Kennedys, Marilyn Monroe, Joe DiMaggio, Will Rogers, Peter Lawford, um, all these kind of big names, right? Supposedly, this is also the hotel or the resort where mm-hmm. Marilyn Monroe and JFK uh, did Had it. A supposed affair, and where she supposedly died. Well, it's it what? is where she, it's mm-hmm. it's where she spent her last weekend before overdosing in L.A. Well, they no, did she overdose in L.A. or did she overdose there and was brought back? Mm, I don't know, Marie. Bum, bum, bum. Boy, we should right. do that. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Now <laughs> we should not not overdose not overdose at a at a hotel. But um, <laughs> we should that that that's sort of an interesting that's an interesting um conspiracy to dig into well now so the place then ultimately became under the attention of the nevada gaming authorities as well specifically because of sinatra's uh specifically because of sinatra's connections to the uh to the chicago mafia Mm -hmm. and specifically to sam giannaka who was um who was there quite frequently and also seemed to have some kind of potential business interest there so uh giannaka was uh like the de facto successor to Al Capone um, and was was uh, known as the godfather of the American mafia. So he is a very mm-hmm. famous figure in mafia history. Huh. Um, and so eventually where this place kind of ended up was 
the gaming commission kind of pressured Sinatra to close it down, to, to get rid of it, sell it, whatever. Um, they got rid of the gaming license or Sinatra's gaming license. And, uh, he sold it on October 7th of 1963, uh, which kind of ended, uh, Lake Tahoe's what's considered its golden age for gambling and entertainment and stuff. Mm. It's been, it's, it's since that point, it's kind of changed hands a lot, right? It's, it really has never gotten back to that, you know, power and prestige that can come with mafia folks and supermodels and drugs and whatever. But what's fascinating with all of that is supposedly the, the hotel or the lodge also had a lot of nefarious things occur there besides the kind of the standard mafia nefarious stuff. Right. Um, including that it was a, uh, as the legend goes, a popular place for the mafia to drop bodies. So they would, well, yeah, if you have gambling, you have a lot of mafia activity. You have to have some place that, you know, like the pine barrens or something like that, you know, and a, a rough equivalent that you can go in and, uh, and get rid of your dead people. Exactly. Now, the idea was that, yeah, they would just dump them into the lake. And these rumors were really spurred on recently because of a story from August of 2011 when uh, they found a scuba, uh, scuba divers found a body of a man who drowned in Lake Tahoe like 20 years previous. Hmm. The, guy, the guy's body was so well preserved that they could like they could identify him from his body. Wow. Right, it's, it's a very rare. It's very rare to be able to do that after like a month in the water. It's well, even rarer for it to be. It's even rarer for it to have occurred after twenty years. That's the rejuvenating quality of the lake, though. Really. <laughs> well, so um, the, <laughs> water uh, babies could be water babies. Well, so the the reason the supposedly the reason is that it's it's so cold in, in Lake Tahoe yeah. that the microbes that actually cause you know. Uh, decomposition of your body can't act can't act as quickly as they would like to or as they normally would and so you know um so nothing <laughs> nothing just happens there and so the rumors kind of for this mass graveyard uh, spread all the way from it being you know gamblers or mafiosa or whatever to even ideas of it being potentially uh, railroad workers chinese chinese nationals who came over to build the railroad um through california and nevada who the government decided, well, you know what? We, we're just going to kill all of you, right? Like we're just going to get rid of you. Oh, somehow. Oh, um, that's especially dark. It's very, yeah, it got dark quick. And so, uh, that's, that's actually supposedly originally what the rumor was that Cousteau saw down there was that he, he goes oh. down, he comes up terrified and he says, the world is not ready for what I've seen. And the rumor mill starts and, you know, it's, oh, it's a mass grave of, of immigrants or it's a, um, you know, it's a bunch of gamblers or it's mafia dudes or whatever, or, or it's a giant monster. Like, but right. He didn't so even go, he wasn't even there. He wasn't even there. It's terrible. Man. Well, my favorite thing that I found out about like Tahoe in researching Tahoe Tessie is a little bit more lighthearted. Uh, somewhat, somewhat more lighthearted. Well, I'll, I'll entertain I, it. Are you on? Okay. All right. So a lot of people say that, you know, they haven't seen, you know, they haven't seen something that looks like two humps or, you know, ser serpentining through the water, but they have seen huge, ginormous goldfish. Interesting. Yes, it is interesting. So as of 2013... They were reporting a a uh, a definite increase in giant goldfish in Lake Tahoe that they're being able to find and try and get rid of because they are um, invasive species, you know, and they think that they're getting there because, you know, you're you're you you know you don't want to you don't want to flush Goldie and you. you getting in the back of the van to go up for a trip to Tahoe. So you just take her with you and you just release her into, into Tahoe or else somebody is using them as bait for fishing or something like that. And these little fish survive <laughs> and, are, and grow off of like the algae and whatnot, it looks like, and have gotten to the size of being um, 
fairly big. I yeah, have to so, find exactly how how so, big the biggest one they found is, but they're they're large. So actually, the the longest the the, lar- mm-hmm. the longest the longest oh, here it is. yeah the longest goldfish uh, the mm-hmm. uh, believed to be the longest goldfish is a goldfish named uh, Goldie. Well, yeah, but that's not they didn't find Goldie in 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 Tahoe. No, but they have found yeah. goldfish that have been abandoned in lakes in yeah. the UK that have been as big as 16 inches long. Yes. So 16 inches and 5 pounds. They can get to be huge. Yes. Goldfish can get to be very very big. And actually they're they are making trouble um they're making trouble frankly all over the place. <laughs> actually, yes. it's quite it's quite interesting. There's if you google giant goldfish, there's stories from Australia, from the UK, from America, from right, from all over the place. Um and they did the one they have a picture of is uh, is a woman, a researcher from the University of Nevada, Reno, um, holding one that is nearly a foot and a half long and four point two pounds. Wow! And they're like they found like a nice little corner in the in the lake where there's about fifteen other giant goldfish, according to the, the environmental uh, scientist, uh, Sandeep Chandra of uh, the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, it's an indication that they were probably schooling and spawning. Hmm. I know, which sounds like it should be super cute, and it's not. It's an invasive species that could interfere with the ecosystem already existing in the lake. It's still kind of cute. It sounds so it's, cute. It's pretty cute, yeah. invasive. So yes. um, so here's here's kind of the, the general rundown, I think, of the science behind a lot of these giant lake things they're all goldfish they're all goldfish it's we've proved it tonight it's the end of the episode we're done um one so one there's a couple popular theories so okay we kind of gave short short shrift here uh to tahoe tessie unfortunately right but uh you know if 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 my bet is between you know graveyard on the bottom of the lake versus tahoe tessie i think i'm going graveyard Mm. um the idea of these giant lake monsters... Because it's got to be one or the other. There is be, no in-between people. No, it can't be, it's black, it's white. It, it is can't one be, of the two. It can't be neither. That's not an option no, tonight. No, it's not. The uh, the idea behind these kind of giant lake monster stories, a lot of the times one common refrain that's given is, well, you know, they survived from the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Right? Or they, they survived somehow in underwater caves. And so that's partly... Oh, Tessie is thought to exist as uh, in these kind of deep underwater caverns, places like Cave Rock. Cave Rock is especially uh, supposed to be especially, you know, a good place to see Tahoe Tessie, although there really have only been a handful of sightings over the years. Maybe, you know, documented sightings, maybe at most 100, but, you know, quite, quite low since the since really English uh or, or Anglo settlers first got to the area in like the 1840s, 1850s. Um, and considering how popular it was as a tourist destination, that's pretty low ultimately I'd say, mm-hmm. but, uh, but there are kind of, it's a very deep Lake. It's very cold. It has a very specific kind of ecosystem and you know, there's the potential for something big to be hiding down there. I suppose the problem with that kind of thinking or a, one part of the problem with that thinking is, how much does something that that's that big have to actually like how much food would it have to consume? (laughs) Right. So, um, maybe the closest, maybe the closest kind of equivalent in size, let's say to the bigger side of Tahoe Tessie is a sperm whale. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sperm whales are, they get to be about 52 feet in length on average. Um, that's mature males, but, they, there have been reports of 67 feet and even some kind of slightly bigger ones, but they're, they're quite big and they also d- deep quite, uh, they dive quite deeply. So uh, they are actually the second deepest diving mammal um, followed only by Cuvier's beaked whale, which is, which is super fun. And those can de- uh, dive as far as 3,300 feet. Now the sperm whale consumes about a ton of uh, fish a day. Ah. So a lot. A lot. Yeah. A lot. 
So and how many of those are giant goldfish? Sorry. <laughs> right. And so the um the uh, the 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 sperm whale kind of depth generally is around 3,000 to 4,000 feet deep that they go. Yeah. They, uh, they dive again. Sperm whales have to dive. It's not like, you know, these, um, it, it may not necessarily be the case with Tahoe Tessie that she would have to dive if she existed. Um, but their prime, their primary food source is giant squid. <gasps> the rest of that is octopus, mm. fish, shrimp, crab, and then, uh, bottom, yeah. bottom dwelling sharks. Nice. Yeah. So, um, I think the big takeaway you're trying to, you're trying to gently let us all down with here. If I can just, if I can just rip the bandaid off, there's just not enough food for, for Tahoe Tessie. Well, there's not enough food. It's not deep enough necessarily. It's just totally made up. Is that what you're trying to to tell me? To be the science is against it. Well, to be the size that it is. It, yeah. I mean, it's probably right. So You're saying there's a chance. (laughs) <laughs> there's a chance there's definitely a chance right um so <laughs> you're saying the odds are in her favor so what, what i'm hearing that there's it's out there she's just very shy she might be shy she might, she be, might shy. be shy you know she's babysitting the water babies now on the on the other hand sturgeon require two to three percent of their body weight per day to eat to, to grow correctly right right so again, though, if we're if we're taking about that same idea, right, right? That's that's a lot. That's a huge amount of food for Tahoe Tessie to eat. So the sturgeon or what she's eating. Mm, maybe. Boom. Maybe. I'm just gonna keep trying it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, plesiosaurs. So there's there's two types mm-hmm. of plesiosaurs, right? And that's the general idea that they would be plesiosaurs. Okay. You mm-hmm. have the plesiosauromorph, which are the ones that have the mm. long necks, or the mm-hmm. uh, plesauromorph, which are the ones that have short necks. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they both species appear to actually have had to eat um, kind of gizzard stones to help oh. them digest things, right? Similar to birds. That's interesting. Which, again, makes sense, right? Because, again, we yeah. believe that the dinosaurs evolved into birds eventually. Yeah. So the fact that there are kind of similarities there makes some sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's believed that they primarily use the long necks to just kind of like kick through the dirt and stuff on the sea bottom floor. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And so then primarily what they would eat are uh, what are known as the benthos, okay, which are animals, kind of organisms that exist on a seabed. All specifically right. what they mean. Yep. Okay. Yep. So essentially plesiosaurs would sit at the bottom, stick their necks around and move stuff around and whatever, and then eat kind of, you know, lobsters and crabs and whatever stuff that was eating off of these, the decaying stuff that's on the bottom of the, of the water. Right. 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 Um, so she could eat the corpses is what is your other absolutely argument yeah she well yeah she, she could eat the corpses long neck, she could be kicking up some of the corpses right, right if they're right. if they're there they would eat the poor they would eat the uh they would eat the what's it yeah absolutely now the that's the long necked ones those are the long necked ones okay okay good okay good, good. the short necked ones were Back on track were carnivores were apex predators in fact ah oh, okay these are the ones like the scary one in jurassic world Jurassic, whatever it was, one of those fine, fine Chris Pratt movies. It yeah, could have whichever even been one, in, right? Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah, so it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> one of those ones, the short. So the ones with short necks there um, mm-hmm. would would eat primarily by ambushing prey, uh-huh. right, and then eating what they could find essentially, right. So uh-huh. these ones had very sharp teeth, uh, very strong jaws and necks, and were also able to. Um, you know, just swim very quickly is the, is the general idea. Now we don't, a lot of this stuff comes from kind of like, you know, paleobiology, which is fascinating, but again, like we don't know that until we actually have one and we probably never will. Mm, it's true. It's a little bit of assumptions going on. That's absolutely. Fine. Okay. I'm sure Katie's not like, Wah. no, she's probably, she's probably not having a great time. Right. <laughs> um, now here's the thing though, right? It's going to love it. She's going to love the giant, the giant goldfish. Well, so, 
she will love the giant goldfish for rating number one. I know. <laughs> uh, one interesting thing, though, about these types of dinosaurs, mm-hmm. too, is that we believe that they might actually have been warm-blooded, like pterosaurs or theropods. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, w- one of the reasons that we think this is that it appears they had a high, uh, a high metabolism based on the way that some of their bones grow. Hmm. Right, and, and kind okay. of, you know, yeah. the different sizes that we see there. Um, it's still not exactly known, of course, right? Mm-hmm. But it's believed that these uh, plesiosaurs were more similar to the way that birds metabolize things and how their bones grow than the way with, um, you know, the way that, like, say, uh, other uh, other reptiles or other giant reptiles like dinosaurs or whatever would have existed at the time. I'm with you. Okay. <sighs> now, I just don't like how this is shaping up. You're putting down all these facts and I'm logic sorry, Marie. And- I'm so oh, sorry. Man. Okay. Now here's the other thing that kind of hurts, uh, or not really hurts, I guess. One question that I always had looking at this stuff really was, um, you know, what, it kind of depends on what was the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs too. Right. Because mm-hmm. if we, if the dinosaurs just died out because of like lack of food or something, Mm-hmm. then it makes it kind of makes sense then that maybe something like this could exist somewhere right there's one of these giant lake monsters in a in a certain ecological niche that's just like kicking butt able to get as much food as it wants right like doesn't have to worry about any of that other stuff but there has to be more than one for it to survive oh absolutely yeah absolutely right, right? so that's the, that's the other thing it's like then how long do they survive after if your if your hypothesis is right, there's they kind of starve out, but they're able to sort of sequester themselves someplace where they're able to, you know, to eat all the food and everything else. But how long does that honestly last? All the way to the present date? That seems pretty. That's pretty aggressive. Yeah, it's hard. It's it's hard to kind of gauge. I think, right? Yeah. Because how um, long do they live, anyways? I, These are all excellent questions. Yeah, that we don't know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> right, and no one knows the answer to. Frankly, here's no. what we here's what we do know, though. Right? right, we know based on the best science available to date on this stuff that the primary method, or really the thing, the event that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, mm-hmm. was the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. This Big is buzz killer. And so, what this is essentially is um, a meteor or an asteroid. I should say, not a meteor, an asteroid. Mm-hmm hits the earth it hits at the um it hits this is really hard to say and so i'm going to say it wrong probably but the uh chicxulub crater right it hits Mm. on the yucatan peninsula peninsula right creates this giant crater and then Mm. basically you know essentially um essentially leading to mass extinction as you know uh sunlight is blocked from all the debris and all the kicked up dust and just the damage generally causing a an ice age uh, right um this is what's known as the alvarez hypothesis which was just a you know it's still considered a hypothesis but it was considered a good option but not the necessarily best one until we actually found the uh the crater itself in the 1990s damn nice yeah. guess uh well so Solid actually it work so actually it wasn't a, it wasn't necessarily a guess what what they what they looked for was um, the way that we we tell kind of how dinosaurs, you know, when they existed, how their ecological systems change, all that stuff is like looking at layers of dirt as we dig down. Right. So mm-hmm. um, it's super interesting, actually. There's like there are parts of the world where you can still go and see the boundary between like the the Cretaceous period and then the uh, Cenozoic era, right? So the Mesozoic era when yeah. dinosaurs existed and then the Cenozoic era, which is our era today, you can actually go and see like, that's the dividing line. <laughs> this, is when, this is when the asteroid hit. It's nuts, right? So now you're, but you're saying that if this was the case, then it would be less likely for something like a giant Loch Ness monster to be able to... See, well, well, that's the thing, though. I don't know, because I would think... Shut up, my son. Put on... Just make a guess. I (laughs) I would say both of them. Both of them are pretty good, right? I mean, like, let's say it's the Ice Age. It 
it can still it's still existing down in a well it would still have to have some sort of surf what it, it, it still has a chance <laughs> it's a chance i guess the th- <laughs> well the, th- the the reason that i wonder this actually is because uh-huh. i would think that in some ways the ocean or not even the ocean this is a lake uh-huh in some ways though lakes are kind of and i'm probably completely wrong about this so if we have any listeners who are um you know, uh, biologists or zoologists yeah. or whatever, which Educated I know we do on this type of thing. Yeah. One of our newest yeah. patron, one yeah. of our newest patrons is a zoologist. So thank you. Shut the front door. Thank not a cryptozoologist, no, not a cryptozoologist, re- but a, a, like not, not that, not that, you know, cryptozoology isn't real, but a <laughs> zoologist, zoologist, that's awesome. No. Yeah. A real, a real zoologist, which is very nice. cool. Uh, yeah. Which is very, nice. very nice. Um, but so, the so we probably lost that person by now oh absolutely we did. <laughs> they're like i shall take that money back thank you very much oh yeah 100 percent. we're out so <sighs> the, the kind of interesting thing to me is i would think that lakes and oceans and things like that bodies of water that are affected by temperature changes mm-hmm. but maybe not at all of their depths. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, wouldn't is, the ocean have a better, I, I think, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Because when, if it's a freshwater lake, an isolated lake, how much water is actually in that lake is going to ebb and flow depending on runoff and the weather, right? There's, well, there's no other way for it to get water or to fill or deplete. Well, there are right. There's there's droughts. There's that's what um, I mean. That's what I mean. It's okay, like okay. it's not like it's not like it's not like the ocean that has other that is much larger. That has you know that still has oh, I, those okay, things affecting okay. it. Okay, I'm saying that it, to me, it's much less likely that a lake would have something like this versus an ocean, because a lake is a self relatively self contained and is at the mercy of drought or is at the mercy of runoff and would have all these fluctuations and would have a lot more growth and a lot more, um, you know, a lot more just general inhabitants around it that would be able to monitor it and become polluted a lot faster as well. So that's what I mean, or would have, you know, an influx of dead mobsters. So I just keep thinking that the ocean is, a is just, just makes, much more general sense because you can have something like a giant squid right you well, can have something well, you, huge that you'll never see well that's and that's actually the other part of this that i think is really interesting. team giant squid is Sorry, if yeah, you if you think about what like think about the damage that a goldfish is doing to some of these lakes yes right like it's just completely yeah. decimating their ecosystem yeah. like yeah. you take an apex predator or even something that just eats the stuff that collects the debris on the bottom of the lake yes you stick that into a confined area i think you're completely right marie there's there's the, the chances of it affecting that are, are, are too great or, or large enough right. that I think it doesn't make any sense. I <sighs> wish I was wrong about anything, my friend. It's about sad. anything in my life that I wished I was not right about. This right here? It's, disproving it's or trying to disprove, trying to disprove uh, Tahoe Tess? That's not to say, you know, maybe, maybe our listeners have seen her or have better theories about how, how she would be surviving up there. We would love to hear it because, you know, we don't, we don't want there to be no, uh, no lake monsters. No, That's absolutely depressing. not. Who wants a world with no lake monsters? It's ridiculous. So, <sighs> actually, uh, new patron... Water babies, however. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> new patron, Lucy. Uh, thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for supporting it, Lucy Burton. Uh, she is our... Uh, she is now officially our resident zoologist because she's the only one Lucy? I know that listens. Sweet! Wonderful times. Thank you, Lucy. Great time. We're sorry. We're sorry that we have insulted your intelligence straight out of the gate. Sorry for this episode, Lucy. All right. We- <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this week's episode of the Mad Scientist Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cogswell, here with my co-host, Marie Mayhew. Oh, hang in there, Tessie. Hang in there. Hang in there, Tessie. Hang Tahoe, in there, Tessie. girl. She'll get back. All right. <laughs> Dear listeners, thank you so much for listening. Uh, This, again, is the Mad Scientist Podcast. If you like the show, consider supporting us on Patreon. Send us an email. Give us a review. Rate us five stars on Facebook and iTunes and everywhere else and whatever. And um, and yeah, just reach out. Love hearing from fans. All right, Marie. We'll be back next week with another episode. 
Good night. It's all very exciting. Good night. This episode is copyright the Mad Scientist podcast. All rights reserved. <laughs>